Well, guys, grab hold of a Bible, if you would. We are going to be in Luke's gospel. Back there tonight, excited to be there. We're going to be in Luke chapter 20. Hope you got a Bible. You're making your way there. If not, there's Bibles around you, page number on the screen, use an electronic device. However it works, be with us there in the Scriptures. Excited to have you here. You're in the overflow or you're online, we invite you to the same. Hey, grab a Bible. Make sure you're with us. Follow along so that God would open up His Word to you and that He would be the one that would speak to you. It is so much what we need, and we're asking for that now. So let's do it. We take one more moment and pray. This is one of those moments where we're going to just, I'm going to lead, but I'm hoping you're asking that God would take these next moments and make them real and genuine for you, that He would give you understanding in what He would have for you from His Word. Father, we do take a moment, and even before we begin to read and study this chapter out, here we are, Lord. Give us understanding. Help us to follow. Help us to get it. But Lord, we are your your children, and you have a way of working in us that is so precise, showing us, opening up truth to us, speaking to us exactly what we need to hear. Lord, do that this evening. Take truth and, and just make it alive, effective. Give us ears to hear from you. Lord, anything that would make us unable to hear. Lord, would you overcome our weaknesses? Would you break through and and be the one that makes your truth brilliant in that sense to us, just alive and beautiful and drawing after you? We ask for that even right now as we just trust you this evening. We pray for that together in Jesus' name. Amen. Matt. Questions. It's an interesting thing. It's actually one of the primary ways that you learn. Now, you probably know this. For many of you guys who are parents, you know. I mean, from the very first moment when your kids started speaking, it didn't take long before the questions started. Why? (laughs) How come? Why is that? Well, what is that? How come is this? And, and, And that whole process began a journey that actually carries us all the way through life. That there's this way of asking questions, of trying to figure things out, of seeking to learn that really becomes almost just fundamental in the way that God has designed us to learn. Questions are powerful, and that's an exciting thing, and I want you to know that because as we're heading into chapter 20 this evening, it's a chapter of questions. From one side of the chapter to the other, there are questions that are being asked and questions that are being pressed. But I also just need to tell you right now, questions, well, they're not always genuine. Yeah, it would be great if every question was honestly there, but if we could honestly put it this way, it's not going to be that way in this chapter. There's going to be a lot of questions asked, but not really kind of moving towards the conclusion that should be there, and that's going to be part of the problem. In fact, that's right where we began. Yeah, we open up this chapter, and we we see what's taking place there, and it tells us in verse 1, Now it happened on one of those days that he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel, that the chief priests and scribes, together with the elders, confronted him. And they spoke to him, saying, tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who is he who gave you this authority? Yeah, it's the first question. It's the first question out the gate where they're asking by whose authority are, are you speaking? Like, who gives you the right? Where, wherein lies the authority that's behind it? Now, I want to just pause and tell you, if that was a genuine question, it would be a life-giving question. If they, if they were really looking and saying, I want to understand where's, where's the basis of what you're saying, uh, where, where, where are you going in the midst of this, what's going to be happening in the midst of that, if that was a genuine question, question. It could unlock so many things, but it's not a genuine question. In fact, Jesus exposes it by, in turn, instead of answering their question right away, he asks them a question. Not always a bad thing to do, by the way, kind of that, you know, answering a question with a question to kind of probe in that moment. Jesus does it. Verse 3 says, but he answered and said to them, I will ask you one thing and answer me. The baptism of John was it from heaven or from men? Jesus just presses in and he asks them, you know, John's baptism, John the Baptist who had come and, and preceded Jesus, 
and had been one who had gained quite an incredible following throughout Israel. I mean, very popular, very well received, uh, especially among the religious communities. And, and so Jesus just says, so was that God? Was John, was, was what he doing a God-given thing? Or was that of men? I mean, which one do you think? Where is this going to go? It's a powerful question because once more, John, he came to lead the way to Jesus. He was the forerunner to Christ. So he came to point to Jesus and, and lead people there. So Jesus asked them the question, but notice what they do. Verse 5, and they reasoned among themselves saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, well, then why did you not believe him? But if we say, from men, all people will stone us, for they all are persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where he was from. Wow. Okay, this is pretty great just to walk it through. They're not honestly asking. They're not honestly seeking the answers. I mean, they're getting here, and they're asking this question. Well, if we say this, this is what he's going to say. And if we say this, this is what he's going to say. But I just want you to track behind that for a moment. They've already decided. They've already decided. Their mind is already made up about Jesus. They, they're already closed. They're not even asking really this question where they want to know. They're already decided, and they're asking this question for an accusation. They're pressing into there, and therein lies a problem. It's a problem that was true for them, and yet I want to just pause and say in a very kind and genuine way, it's a very prominent problem in our world today. Uh, lots of questions are asked. Lots of people, you know, asking as if they had questions, but really they're not actually open. <laughs> they're not honestly asking, like, well, I really want to know. Like, I really want to know the answer. No, so often the mind is already made up, and even the way they process it isn't genuine. I mean, where they're not asking, okay, is John really of God? They're like, well, you know, if we say that, then they're going to be like, well, you should have listened to John then, you know, and like, well, if we say it's not, then nobody's going to, you know, everybody believes it, and so they refuse even to answer the question, like, we don't know, you know, just, we don't know, but it's such a, a dishonest approach to the question. It's such a dishonest approach to even what's taking place there and even what's happening in the midst of this. And so Jesus just simply answers in verse 8. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Like, if you're not going to answer me, I'm not going to answer you. Like, if you're not going to honestly even seek to kind of press into this, then I'm not even going to enter into this debate. It's a pretty powerful thing to watch Jesus do this. I found myself thinking about it, and there's a proverb. And in uh, the book of Proverbs, in chapter 26, it says, do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. Or it says, you know, there's a time when, when somebody's just speaking foolishly, don't even answer. It, it's not, it's not going to be helpful. It's not going to be life-giving. It's only going to bring confusion. And Jesus literally does that, which is real, but terribly sad. Because once more, if they had honestly been asking the question, it could have led them to the authority of God, to, to what God was doing in the world, but they're not honestly asking a question. And so Jesus isn't answering. He says, well, I'm not going to answer. You know, if you're not going to genuinely work in this, then neither will I. Not a bad approach. And for some of us, hey, that could help. I mean, sometimes maybe you've been there where you have allowed yourself to be kind of pulled into somebody's argument who really isn't seeking answers but they just want to argue. And I can say in the most kind way, nobody's ever been argued into the kingdom of heaven. It's not going to be by your logic that's going to somehow turn the tables. If someone's not genuinely asking, sometimes it's really what Jesus would say, casting your pearls before swine. Like, why would you invest all this time into somebody who really isn't even wanting an answer? Like, it, do, it doesn't even work that way, and he doesn't. Well, with that laid out, he presses this forward, and he's going to ask them a question. But he prefaces it by giving them a, a parable that's going to lead to the question that he wants to ask them. It's a parable that some of your Bibles will say, will say the parable of the wicked vine dressers. So kind of follow along, try to picture the parable. Verse 9, then he began to tell the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard, leased it to vine dressers, and went into a far country for a long time. Now at vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the vine dressers beat him and sent him away empty handed. 
Again, he sent another servant, and they beat him also, trampled him shamefully, and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he sent a third, and they wounded him and, and cast him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Probably they will respect him when they see him. But when the vine dressers saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Okay, pause there. There's the story. It's a pretty incredible story, one that actually wasn't uncommon in those days. I mean, it really, you know, this, he, he owns a vineyard, he kind of leases it to people, but it's a lease, and really he still gets some, you know, benefit back from it. They take advantage of it, and it becomes a very horrible situation. Its power pictures, again, our world. In one sense, God's the vine dresser. He's the one that's created the world, and there's this rebellious world that, instead of honoring him, giving him his due seeks to kind of usurp and, and, and steal everything that's there. It's a pretty powerful parable and lots of details we could dive into, but I think it's simple enough to kind of get there. And so now Jesus asks the question that he had kind of prepared this parable to bring him uh, to this moment. So join me there in verse 15. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? How is this going to work out for them? How, how do you think this is going to work out for them? Jesus is asking. So they've usurped, they've stolen, they've, they've taken the vineyard, they killed his son. Like, how do you think that's going to go for them? And that is meant to provoke them. It's meant to kind of ask the question both that would underscore what they're doing and are about to do because they're about to kill God's son. And, and just kind of just exposing all of that, Jesus answers, verse 16, he will come and destroy those vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, certainly not. I mean, like, they, they understand where this is going. They get what Jesus is saying. He says, here's what's going to happen. I mean, the, the owner of that's going to come, and he's going to deal just furiously. He's going to, you know, wipe all them out, and he'll take that vineyard and give it to others. Now, as Jesus tells this parable, again, it's not a parable. It really is reality. In fact, it's a biblical reality, and Jesus quotes him. I looked at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. It's a pretty big deal. We don't have time to dive into it, but it's a powerful reality that Jesus is showing them that what they're doing and the way that they're responding to him, not only is it wrong, not only is it morally and ethically wrong, it was biblically prophesied. In fact, he quotes from Psalm 118. That might jog somebody's memory because we were just there. That was the triumphal entry. Uh, that was the triumphal entry when Jesus came you know, into Jerusalem, which is in the previous chapter. And there in that psalm, the Hosanna psalm, save that whole reality, is this one that celebrates God presenting his son to the world. And yet even in that psalm that predicted God sending the Messiah, it predicted that he was going to be rejected and that they were going to take and kind of cast him out, reject him, but in rejecting him, they would miss the one that would become the foundation for all eternity, that he would become the cornerstone, he would become the one that lays the foundation for all eternity, and that's exactly what they did. They walk in all of that, and so he just tells them that. He says, you know, he is this stone that is the one that was prophesied, and then he just gives a very practical exhortation to it, which is true then and true now. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken, but whoever it falls will grind him to powder. powder. Jesus is the stone. He's the stone that is the one that God gives. He says, if you fall on him, you're going to be broken. And if you're a believer in Christ, can I tell you, you have been. You, you've come to an end of yourself. You've been broken. You've, you've recognized who you are. To come on Jesus is to bring into that good brokenness, that repentance that's there. But he's like, if you don't, then it's going to crush you. I mean, the Son of God, He is the one that defines life on one side of this to the other. Either you're broken on Him or you're crushed to powder in, in the midst of that. They didn't like it. It's obvious. Verse 19, the chief priests and the scribes that very hour sought to lay hands on Him, but they feared the people, for they knew that He had spoken this parable against Him. They get it. The sad thing is it's not that they don't understand the parable. They just don't respond to it. 
They're unmoved by it. They're unmoved by Jesus's question that was meant to penetrate who they are. Like, how do you think this is going to work out for you? If, if God is the you know, owner of everything and you're living this usurping lifestyle that lives it as if you're in charge and you're in control and you even reject his son, how's that going to work out? It's not going to work out well for you. And yet they, they find themselves unmoved by this. They're unmoved by all of this. In fact, it only kind of stirs up this anger and moves them still to this place of a lack of genuineness, a lack of response that, that only moves it even worse. And so now they have another question for Jesus. Verse 20, so they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous, that they might seize on his words in order to deliver him to the power and authority of the governor. So they're going to have a question for Jesus. Again, some of your Bibles have the, the preface. They're going to ask him a question about paying taxes. It's a pretty incredible both question and answer, but it's worth just noting again, it's not an honest question. Like they're not actually trying to figure out what's right or wrong or even learn what God would have in this. They have tried to figure out one of the most difficult questions that they could think of. And in their mind... It's an unanswerable question. Follow it along. Verse 21, then they asked him, saying, Teacher, we know that you, what you, said, that you say and teach rightly, and you do not show personal favoritism, but teach the way of God in truth. I mean, they just butter this thing up. Full lives, they don't actually believe anything. They just said, they're not genuine. They're like, oh, you always teach the truth. You, 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 you say the right thing, and, and you're always that way. Is it lawful, verse 22, for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? That's the question. It's a question, again, about paying taxes and spending probably more time on it you could do, but in their mind, there is no answer. If Jesus says, no, you shouldn't pay taxes to Caesar, well, they can just turn him into Rome. <laughs> like, that's a capital offense in Roman law. If he says, says yes, they live under an oppressed economy. Rome is oppressing Israel at this point in time. Taxes are horrible. Nobody likes it. For Jesus to endorse it, they kind of feel like it's going to go, you know, kind of against them. They feel like there's no good answer here. I mean, I, I, mean just, I just have this sense. They probably sat down for like hours. Like, what's a question? Like, what's the hardest question? Like, this question. Nobody can answer this question. This is one of those questions that nobody can answer rightly because it's always going to go wrong no matter which way you ask it. Now, Jesus knows it. In fact, I like the way it just tells it in verse 23. He perceived their craftiness and said to them, why do you test me? <laughs> I just want, it's like he sees right through their lies, right through their kind of you know, whole spiel that just kind of came up. He's like, why are you guys being so crafty? Why are you even asking this? But what's interesting is that Jesus is going to answer. Jesus is actually going to answer this question. I pause just to think about this for a moment because we just talked about it, right? We just talked about this one in Proverbs where it says, you know, not to answer a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. I mean, there's a place where you just don't even kind of get into those debates because it's not going to be a good place to go. But the interesting thing is the book of Proverbs actually sets this proverb right next to another one. The very next verse says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Now, again, if you've ever kind of read through Proverbs, you're like, well, now what am I supposed to do? I mean, I thought you said don't answer him, but now you're saying answer him. So am I, am I supposed to answer him, or am I not supposed to answer him? Well, it's not always such an easy answer. Uh, there is, again, where, like, where is it going? Jesus recognized in the first one there was no good benefit to it. They weren't being honest. But this time there is a sense that he's seeking to do it for them. And it says here, for the, unless they be wise in their own eyes, and so he's going to answer, not because it's genuine, not because it's honest. He recognizes they're being foolish. He recognizes they're, they're walking in the midst of this, but he's going to answer the question. And one of the most, you know, again, verses you probably really recognize, he just asks. Verse 24, show me a denarius, which is a Roman coin that they used as currency in those days. Whose image and inscription does it have on it? So he asks them another question. They answer, well, it's, it's Caesar's. Now, again, I, have, I, I just have this, like, really silly imagination. So I kind of almost picture them, like, something's going wrong here. Like, like, they, they're, like they're anticipating this question being unanswerable. And like, Jesus, so show me a coin. And they're like, okay, here's a coin. He's like, well, who's scripture? And they're like, hmm. 
I don't know if I want to answer. <laughs> like, I have a feeling I'm about to kind of say the wrong thing, and they do. They're like, well, it is Caesar's image on the coin. And Jesus says to them in verse 25, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. It's an incredibly powerful answer. Hey, you know, give to Caesar his things. Give to the Caesar things that belong to him. Give to God his things. It's an amazing answer to a difficult question. It's not actually just a difficult question then, it can be a difficult question now. Trying to figure out how to live in a world that is an unrighteous world. Rome's an unrighteous government, you know, oppressing them people, and yet he says, okay, you know, what the Bible calls us to is this recognition of earthly authority, but not surrendering to that, you know, recognizing God's authority in the midst of it, and it's still one of the most beautiful and profound practical answers in the midst of, of just walking through life. And again, probably for everybody in this room, if you're honestly seeking to live for Jesus in this world, somehow you're landing in this question. I mean, you're trying to figure out, like, how do I be, you know, under, you know, you know how do I be an American, but also a Christian? How do I live under law, but also be faithful to God? And it's just beautiful to kind of find Jesus being able to navigate both the hard questions, but beautiful to answer. And it's just good to kind of say, hey, he's able to do that and guide us into that, but let's make sure we're following the context. They're not actually asking. <laughs> they didn't really want to know the answer. They weren't really trying to figure out what God wanted or Jesus wanted. All of this was just to trap Jesus. All of this was to say, no matter what you do, you're going to be in trouble. And he's not. And again, they respond to it. They, they, they marvel. It tells us there in verse 26, but they could not catch him in his words in the presence of the people, and they marveled at his answer and kept silent. I mean, the, the idea of, it just, it blew their mind. I mean, it's like, I didn't think anybody would be able to answer that. Like, nobody's able to answer this question. He just totally, clearly, very accurately, very precisely answered, and it just, they, they sit there dumbfounded, but not actually moving towards Jesus, not actually kind of hearing behind it that Jesus is really the one that is able to answer our questions and able to bring us to the right way to live for God. I mean, it's this horrible thing where they're processing through this, but the lack of genuineness still keeps them there. Well, they've asked their question, and so now it's time for the Sadducees to ask their question. So in verse 27, it says, so some of the Sadducees who deny that there is a resurrection came to him and asked, and they're going to begin to tell him a story. And they're going to ask him about the resurrection, but again, it's powerful for us to understand who these guys are. These are a sect within the Jewish world. Uh, Pharisees were the very religious. The Sadducees are a little bit more politically kind of a, a group in the midst of the Jewish people, and they actually don't even believe in much of the Old Testament scriptures. They don't believe in, in anything past the first five books, and even some of that they don't take literally. And so they come down to the place and said, hey, there, are no, there is no resurrection, there's no angels, there's no demons, there's just none of that. They kind of are this moral group of people who don't really believe in anything supernatural. And you know what? We have people like that today. We have people in, in the same category of where these are, and they're going to come and ask some questions. These are the Sadducees. Hey, I can't help it. It's like one of those old jokes. You know, they don't believe in the resurrection. That's why they're sad, you see. Okay, sorry. It's a really old joke, and you guys probably all heard it, but it's a, it's a great one to think through. But it is that reality of, of in the midst of it, of just saying, okay, here they are. They don't actually believe it, but they're going to have a question for Jesus. It's a question that it's a crazy story based on Jewish law. Like, what do you do when a husband, you know, you know, has a wife and she dies? By biblical law, they would take, you know, one of the siblings and she would become the spouse and they could raise up an heir. It's a long story of kind of God's way of handling brokenness and, and marriage in the world. But they paste it in this story that must certainly been, you know, like their story that certainly proves how foolish it is to even think that there is a resurrection. So follow the story. Verse 28. They come saying, teacher... Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies having a wife and he dies without children, then his brother should take his wife and, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and raise up offspring for his brother. It is again in the Old Testament law for the Jews, again, this kind of 
what's called the Leverite marriage and how that works. Now, verse 29, there were seven brothers. And the first took a wife and died without children. And the second then took her as wife, and he died childless. And the third took her, in like manner, the seven also. Now, that's just, that's kind of a crazy story. I mean, you're like, okay, what is the wife cooking? I mean, she's like, like she's going to kill like all seven brothers, you know, kind of. I mean, anyway, that's a different part of the story. And she says, well, they, they all left her childless, and they all died. Last of all, the woman dies also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife will she become? For all seven had her as a wife. Again, this is their logic where they think through, hey, this is such a broken situation. So you have this woman, you know, he has this, you know, this guy, he's, he, he marries, you know, has, you know, this woman has seven. You know, how does this even work? I mean, how does all of this work where they kind of are going to raise up a child for her? How does this, this whole thing work? It couldn't obviously work. And so for them, it just made it where eternity was impossible. Now, there's a lot behind all that. And again, if you have questions about that law, the Leverite marriage, again, it's fascinating. Obviously, is isn't a part of our culture, nor does it need to be. Nevertheless, it was a part of maintaining the, the Jewish lines. Well, in the midst of that, so Jesus answers it. And so he tells them in verse 34, he answers, said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are counted worthy to attain that age And the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die any more, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God's being sons of the resurrection. So he begins to answer, and and the first thing he just kind of presses into him is that their understanding of how this works isn't going to work. And he talks to him about what relationships are going to be like in heaven. In, In one sense, again, their fallacy was thinking that eternity is just what we're living in now forever. Like, I mean, like what we're going, what life now is just going to be life without end. And he tells them, you're not thinking this through clearly. He says, those relationships there, they're going to be different. Now, let me just quickly say this. We're kind of doing a, a chapter kind of move this evening. We could spend the rest of the evening right here. And I recognize some of you would like that. Others are like, no. But let me just tell you, this is kind of one of those interesting questions. And, and people will ask, well, like, well, what did he just say? Did Jesus just say that marriage doesn't exist in heaven, that, that that's not going to be a part of that? Can I say very simply, that's not what he says. He says we're going to be like the angels. Now, I don't know about you. I have not met any angels and how they live yet. I don't fully understand how that works, nor do we. But can I say it in a very simple way? Heaven's going to be better than you've ever imagined. And our God who made relationships isn't going to take that away from us in heaven. Now, how that's going to live out, I mean, how that works, even in a broken world, what happens if somebody has, you know, two spouses? I mean, what happens, how that whole thing works? You know what? I'm fully confident God can deal with that, but I just want you to know this. Um, I just, I don't think anything's going to be worse. Again, I, I do talk to, to people who are married, and this becomes one of those ones for married couples that are like, well, does that mean like marriage is only here? And I'm just going to tell you, honestly, I honestly just don't know the answer to that because I don't know how angels live, but I do know this. Marriage preceded the fall. Marriage was before sin ever entered the world. Marriage was, relationships were a part of that. And so I don't see that sin, you know, kind of created relationships, nor do I believe heaven's going to take all of that away. I just want to tell you, I think that the God who made us have relationships, they're not going to be anything less than what we have. They're going to be so much better. You're never going to get to heaven and go, well, you know, it's nice to be here, but I kind of miss, you know, like you, you, everything's going to be better and nothing's going to be worse. There's not going to be any part that what is good and relationships are good. Now, that's a big, big question that I didn't fully answer. And the answers are hard to even get through because one more time, we just can't see it. I mean, we talked about it Sunday when we talked about what we know about heaven. Most of what we know about heaven is what's not going to be there. There's no more corruption, (laughs) there's no more sin, nothing's going to fade away. We can talk about what's not there, but the reality of what it's going to be like to be sons of God in heaven, to be daughters of God in heaven, to live there, it is outside of our wheelhouse. We have not joined there. I just want you to know it's going to be better than you've ever imagined, and don't fear it. Don't fear that for you, for your family, for your friends, for your, for your kids. I just want to tell you it's all going to be better for those of us who know God and, and where that is. 
And so Jesus just suddenly says, and says, for starters, you're just not thinking this through clearly. That, you know, eternity is not going to be a continuation of what life is like here. We change. We're going to be like angels. We're going to be sons of God, sons in heaven. I mean, it's a radically, wonderfully, gloriously different existence than anything we've ever imagined. Again, I haven't even begun to explore all the questions that that kind of addresses or leaves us with questions like, how old will we be in heaven? Like, will I be as old as my kids? Will, I be, will we all be the same age? I mean, so many things we don't know. It's just going to be better. And so Jesus just exposes that fallacy by telling them that, hey, this is not the way it is. Those who are counted worthy to attain that age, verse 35, and the resurrection of the dead, they're not, they're not marrying, they're not given in marriage, they can't die. They are equal to the angels and the sons of God being sons of the resurrection. But even Moses showed, verse 37 in the burning bush passage, that the dead are raised when he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. For he is not the God of the dead, but the God but of the living, for all live in him. I mean, in a very profound way, he takes them back to the Torah that they would even accept which the Sadducees, again, they don't believe the prophets. They don't believe anything after the first five books. And Jesus says, even in that, God shows you this. When he calls himself, he's not the God who was the God of Abraham. He is the God of Abraham. He's not the God who was the God of Isaac. He is the God of Isaac. It's a present tense reality because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're still there. I mean, eternity is still going on. He's still a God of the living. And so Jesus just, in a very profound way, shows them that God is certainly speaking of an eternity, of a resurrection, which is so incredibly glorious. Again, we spent Sunday morning on this, and we talked a little bit about our expectation of a resurrection because Jesus was resurrected, and all that that's going to mean, and Jesus is just showing them how just solid and biblical that is. But their response to it is still not good. Then some of the scribes answered and said, teacher, you've spoken well. Which, by the way, the scribes are not the Pharisees, uh, not the Sadducees, they're the other side. Like, you nailed them. (laughs) Like, Jesus, you did a good job. You just showed how well that is. But after that, they dared not question him anymore. I mean, they're just done. Like, okay, we're not going to ask Jesus any more questions because he turns them on us. You know, like, you know, we're not even going to go there. But this is a sad moment. I'm just trying to tell you what a horrible thing this is because... God wants us to seek him. He wants us to ask questions. He wants us to know, but they will not ask honest questions, and they won't even press into it. And so once Jesus begins answering and answering well, instead of that stirring up, like, I want to know more. <laughs> I want to know more. They, they, they close down. Like, we're not, we, we don't even want to know because they've already made up their minds. They've already decided against Jesus. They've already decided they don't want to, to press into that. So now Jesus turns the tables on them. They've been asking him questions, now he's going to ask them another question. Verse 41, he said to them, how can they say that the Christ is the son of David? Now David said of himself in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore David calls him Lord, how is he then his son? It's a pretty powerful question. I mean, Jesus just presses into this, and he's asking them this question, and it's simple, but it's one of the largest questions in understanding God in many ways. He just tells them, okay, so there's this passage, and David is speaking about it. David is the one who's who's saying that, you know, that that the Messiah is going to come, and the the Christ as we know him, and he says he's going to be called, he's going to call him Lord. That's the term for God. That's the term for, you know, God of the universe. At the same moment, the Bible has told us that the Messiah is going to be a descendant of David, that he's going to be a son of David. So Jesus is just asking him a question. So how is that possible? How can he be both the Lord and a son? Now, you probably already know the answer to it, but I just need to press it with you. The answer is very simply Jesus. The answer is that Jesus is this. In fact, in one of the most profound and amazing realities in all eternity, Jesus becomes fully God and fully man. That he becomes literally a descendant of David. He's born into David's line, and yet he's God. It's really, honestly, one of the most mysterious and glorious truths that you could ever wrap your mind around, that God so loved us that he gave us his son, that God himself 
takes on flesh, that he becomes both God and man, that changes everything. It's, it's one of the things that boggle theologians, that, that amaze. It's one of the hardest things to understand, and yet one of the most beautiful. And again, he's just drawing them to it. Like how to draw them so that they would be asking about him, to draw them so that they would see who he is, and, and to ask those questions that would lead them to see who Jesus is. It's a great question. But they don't answer at all. <laughs> they, they have nothing. I mean, it just kind of lets us know that they, you know, he speaks this and all the gospels kind of let us know that this, they're just like, I got nothing. You know, there's, not, there's, there's not anything they're going to step into that. There's not any place of it. But one more time, it's not because they're honestly trying to figure it out. They're honestly not asking the question. They're not in that space of, of seeking the answers. And out of that, it becomes this incredibly horrible moment. So at the end of all these questions, Jesus just does this. Verse 45. So then in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes. They love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at the feasts, who devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers. These are going to receive a greater condemnation. So he speaks of the scribes, he speaks of these religious leaders, and he just kind of just warns his disciples, and he warns those, and he warns us, hey, beware of these. Beware of these who, who make a showing of being good and make this showing of being religious, but they're not honestly even seeking. They, they're just doing it for show. It's pretense. It's all kind of this external thing, but there's not this internal reality, which kind of flows over everything that we've seen in this chapter. That, that really is this incredibly hard thing because some of the most profound questions are being asked. You know, I mean, just think through what we've talked about in this chapter. Who is Jesus, the Son of God, Son of Man? What's eternity? You know, how does that work? You know, how does that whole thing play out? Where, who's got authority? You know, how is he handling the world? I mean, these are some of the most fundamental, huge, and basic, and yet needed questions for all of life, but they're not honestly even seeking the answers. And that's where it finds itself so problematic. That's where it finds itself such a hard thing as we walk through this, this chapter because, guys, they're asking questions, but they're not actually seeking that. So I just want to press that for a moment. I think through everything we're talking through and I've kind of, you know, thinking through what this looks like and, and maybe it just needs to begin with a warning to say, hey, if this is you this evening, if maybe you're here or even online and, and you know, kind of you have your excuses why you don't believe in Jesus and yet honestly thinking, I mean, are you honestly asking? I mean, because are you honestly seeking? You know, because there's such a horrible place of people who aren't there and they're missing even seeking that. Or let me put it to you this way. I think about one of the promises that God gives, and he gives it throughout the scriptures, but I want to say it to you in the most simple way. In Jeremiah 29, for example, God just speaks to Israel. He says, if you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart, and I will be found by you, says the Lord. Again, this is one of those places where God says, you know, all the way through scripture, if you'll draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. If you'll seek me. Now, let's just think this through for a moment. This is a promise that's not based on your IQ or your ability. It's really on God. It's a promise that God says, if you're honestly going to seek me, if you'll ask the right question, if you'll honestly ask the questions, and if you honestly want to know the answers, I'll help you find them. I will meet you. I will meet you. He says, if you will seek me, you will find me, and I will be found by you. I, I don't know how to just communicate how profound and how beautiful this is. God makes this promise to everybody. There's not anybody in our world that God looks at and says, it's just beyond you. <laughs> like, you can't get here. He says, if you'll seek me, if you will seek me, I will be found by you. And to me, this is this display of the grace and the mercy and the power of God that he would communicate to us, you know, as frail human, just humans in the midst of it, but it's a certain promise. If we're asking the questions, if we really want to know, if we really want to know who God is, if we want to know these questions that we've talked about tonight, like who is Jesus and how does eternity work and, and, and how does, I mean, I want to know, and then God says, I'll, I'll show you. It's a guaranteed promise. It's a, it's a promise of, of God 
meeting us. And, and I just hold that out to you. There's just, if that's you this evening, I'm just telling you that God would draw you to him, that he would promise you if you'll seek him, if you'll ask the questions of him, you'll find him. I love that. And it's again true for us as Christians, that that continues to grow in our lives. This idea of growing in the knowledge of God and growing in his ways, it's a promise. It's a promise where God says, if you'll seek me, if you'll draw near to me, then we'll find him. And he will continue to open up incredible truths to us, that place of, of honest questions and honestly seeking to grow in Christ and honestly seeking to grow in him. There's this incredible promise. And I wish I could say that better. I wish I could tell it something to help you to understand how massive this is, how big this is. I mean, like, how include, just, just not anybody that isn't working for, because if you can see this, then the horribleness of this chapter only grows. Because here's a group of people who are asking questions, but they didn't want the answers. They didn't really want to seek God. And it's not that he wouldn't have showed them. He would have showed them, but they didn't ask. They weren't asking honestly. They weren't asking honestly anywhere in the chapter. They, didn't, they never really wanted to know the answers to the questions that they were asking. But they could have. Because God says so. God says, I will show you if you will ask me. If you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're really asking and you're not just, you know, using it as a show and you're not just throwing it up as an excuse, which for many people, the questions they have, they are that. They are just excuses that allow them to continue in their rebellion. And instead of saying, no, I really want to know. I really want to understand. Then God promises to meet. And so I just want you to feel that as we kind of think this through and maybe even move towards a close this evening because there is this incredible place that is, is God saying he would do this in this horrible place of, of missing that. So let me just kind of hold it out to you and, and ask in that way, well, I, I wonder where you are on this. Again, maybe I'm speaking to somebody that you're not a follower of Jesus and right now you think even in your own mind, it's because you have questions that nobody can ask. Nobody can answer them. You, you feel like you have reasons that keep you from believing in Jesus, and you're like, well, you know, I have these questions, and, and I have these things. And I just want to tell you, I would press before you and say, I don't think they're honest, because God is giving you a promise that if you would ask the questions of Him, He would meet you. He would, he would meet you, and He would show you Jesus, and He would show you who He is it's a promise. And if I can explode even one person who's living behind a lie, who's living behind an excuse that you think that you're an open thinker, but you are so closed, then God would open your mind to him, and I pray for that right now. But please grab with me. I'm not just talking to unbelievers. I'm talking to us who know Jesus as well. See, some of us, I mean, we, we came to Christ, and we came with questions. We came wanting to know and that was good that God met us, but it's a weird thing. Sometimes it happens where Christians kind of reach this place where they're no longer really asking, where they don't really want to know anymore. I mean, it's just like, hey, I'm good enough. I'm in, you know, I'm kind of in the door. I believe in Jesus. And yet I want to tell you, God would look at us and tell us, hey, there is so much more for you. I think about how Hebrews would tell us, you know, he says, you know, sometimes we, we live in this place of I'm a spiritual infancy. And, and he says, you know, there's so much more. There's so much that God would open up for you. But he says, you, 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 you've become, you know, just still being bottle fed in many ways, still being spoon fed instead of saying, God, I want to know you more. I want to, I want to, to find what you would have for me. And, and I just want to invite you into it because there's a beautiful place of saying, God, I, I, I want to know more. I want to, I, I want to believe you because you said, if I would seek you, and if I'd seek you, if I can, that's not just how you get in the door, that's life, then you would continue to unpack for me and continue to take me deeper than I've ever gone before. And, and your whole life could be spent on a journey of saying, God, I want to know more. I want to know more. It's a beautiful place to come. So I, I want to end with an invitation to a life that doesn't look like Luke chapter 20. Questions that were really just excuses, that they really weren't wanting the answers. I wanna call you to want the answer. I wanna call you into a place of, of seeking. And so I just hold it out to you one last time and we'll close in prayer. God has given you a promise. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, God says. He says, if you, if you will ask me genuinely, 
I will make sure you, you'll get there. I will open this to you. So let's ask God for that now. Let's kind of press into such a space that we would long that God would help us be the ones that seek and find. Would you join me? God, I think of just your promise, and it's a great promise. It's one that boggles my understanding and finds it just amazing in who you are. A God who says that you would meet us. And I I just want to admit to you, Lord, what you know so well. That is accommodating to our weaknesses in such huge ways. That you would meet one like me. And you would help me in my finite, simple simple understanding, my, my ability to reason. And you would meet me and help me to find you. Lord, I think about how amazing that is. And it's a display of your greatness. It's a display of your faithfulness and of your mercy that I find beautiful, incredible, hopeful, and life-giving. God, when I think about what you promised to all of us, it only becomes more tragic for the ones that aren't honestly seeking and hiding behind questions that they really don't want the answers to. God, we walk through a chapter of just seeing that, and it's a tragic, hard space. God, if there's anybody in that space right now, explode that. Help them to see the folly of their excuses that keep them from pressing in. Draw those to you that don't know you. Meet them in that faithful promise that if they would seek you, they would find you. But God, also meet those of your kids here who have settled in some kind of spiritual infancy and they're no longer seeking. They're no longer asking. They're no longer wanting to know more. And and the tragedy is that you would show them more, that their mind is not inadequate, that their ability to reason doesn't hold them back, that their personality isn't a problem. You can overcome all of that. You just promise us if we would really seek, we would find. You would take us deeper. You would show us more. God, explode just the, the, the lies that hold us back and press us in. And then, God, in your faithfulness, please do this. Meet us as we seek you. Help us to find you, to discover your beauty, your majesty, your authority, the reality of who you are, Jesus, as the Son of God and Son of Man, the reality of all that you would do. Lord, help us to see it more. Draw us after you. Lord, help us to see, to know you. I ask for that for me and for each of us this evening, and I thank you for just who you are. In Jesus' name. Amen.